Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. It's a nice, beautiful day here in southeastern Oklahoma. I just wanted to take a temporary departure from our study in Revelation to address an issue that some have written me about. Uh, we ought to complete our study in this book in by May. So I don't think it'll it'll harm too much, cause too much delay. I get emails from viewers who are desperate to understand why they're not the Christian that they think God expects them to be. So I want to address that issue from a, a biblical perspective. You know, I'm talking about believers who seem discouraged over the progress or the lack of, of, of it in their Christian life. And as I as I understand it, you know the I believe the cause has to be first addressed. How in the world did you ever get to to that place, you know, of despondency whenever you started out so well? Just when did you first realize that your this new exciting life in Christ had lost some of its luster? What really happened to cause you to to end up feeling? So confused, depressed, hurt, despondent, unworthy, guilty, defeated. The answer lies in those early days of your new life in, in, in the Lord. Remember back to the first days of your salvation whenever, you know, joy and happiness just came flooding into your life. Whenever you seized every opportunity to be with, with God's people, whenever, uh, wherever. Remember when uh, the teachings of Jesus were hurled at you as though you were an enemy of God. I mean, were you indicted? Let's be honest. Were you indicted for your failure to live up to all that the Bible said that, you know, Christians ought to do? And did you find yourself feeling guilty? You know, that you didn't give as much as others gave or you didn't do as much as others did did you shrink down in your pew whenever a call came from the pulpit for, you know, workers to serve in the church? Just how spiritual did you feel when you were called upon to read one verse uh, from the Bible and you couldn't even find it? How much joy in the Lord? Did you sense whenever you couldn't bring yourself to do what you really ought to be doing and just quit doing those things that you really shouldn't be doing? Those are the questions that I would ask. Did you feel that you measured up to what a good Christian ought to look and act like? How many times have you rededicated your life to Christ? Or felt guilty because you hadn't led a single soul to Christ? How guilty have you felt whenever you knew that, that you, had, you had let the Lord down? Let me ask you, just how much of that pressure do you think was brought into your life by the Lord Himself? Well, you should have said none. Dearly beloved, many Christians are in a conflict that they themselves cannot overcome. This conflict is the vain struggle of the self-life that becomes frustrated and fails. Self. What is self? Self is the old man, the sin nature, the, the flesh, the old sin nature, whatever you want to call it. But it's everything about us that opposes the will and the work of God in and through our lives. And it's manifest in numerous ways. I think the most common uh, show of self is that it seeks to, to improve a believer's standing before God by what it can do, you know, in and of itself. And in, in most Christian uh, circles today, 
many well-intentioned believers are, are unaware of the very existence even of the self-life within. Yet coming to a biblical understanding of the self-life inside us can promise and secure rest. Uh, there can't be any genuine, real genuine spiritual growth in the life of the believer until the believer is, is able to receive what Scripture says about self. And there is an answer to the travesty of self, and that answer is the person of Jesus Christ. He actually takes the, the sincere Christian through this painful, struggling process of failure or seeming failure in order to expose self for what it is. And then he later grants that believer rest. And few things seem to attack sound reasoning more than for one to advocate that a believer not exercise self-effort. After all, I mean, shouldn't a Christian try to, to the best that he, he possibly can? You know, isn't he to put out more effort when he's not doing good enough? I mean, surely everybody would agree practice makes perfect, right? Well, that, that may be true in the real world, folks, but that's not true in the Christian life. Th that might seem true, logical to the natural reasoning, but it does not, absolutely does not apply to the Christian life. It's when we're weak that he's strong. Self seeks to improve uh, upon something that can't be improved upon. The flesh profits nothing, folks. A sin nature that can do nothing but fail, that is the very essence of self. It can't be improved upon. It can't be perfected. That's why God crucified the flesh. Self is that hideous part of us that just by its domineering nature, it prohibits us, the new creation in Christ, from expressing itself. But when it's discovered and it's put in its rightful place, then struggling and frustration and all of that junk becomes a thing of the past. Only until we discover the true nature of the self-life can we experience victory over sin, have, have de real desires towards service, appropriate desires towards service, and, and gain rest. I have stated this fact more times than I can remember. Scripture is not just a book of instructions to the believer on how to live the Christian life like, like some computer manual. Okay, It is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. If all you hear is someone badgering you to try harder, okay, and you're not hearing the wonderful news concerning what Christ has done for you, what He's done, what He's in the past, what He's done, what He's doing now, what He'll do for you in the future, you are bound to drown, drown in a sea of failure. But you're not a failure. You're not a failure from God's standpoint. Far from it. In fact, you, you did not begin your life in Christ with fears, doubts, uncertainties, and all that junk. Just why was it that your early Christian life was a, a, a blessed relief from the, the, the guilt of your past? Because your focus at that time was drawn to what God did for you in Christ. It was later that, that that focus was reversed from what God did to what you, you feel like, well, you ought to do to earn God's favor, His grace. Your present trouble didn't begin until others began to heap responsibilities upon you, which you got, God never equipped, required, nor intended that you bear those burdens. So slowly you began, over a period of time, you began to use your old self to try and accomplish the impossible demands that others required of you. And then soon, before you knew it, you were fully back under the full dominion of the law, the old self that died with Christ at Calvary.
Folks, the entire epistle to the Galatians was written to address the very problem that I'm talking about. I care for you folks deeply. I get messages messages like this every now every so often, and it just breaks my heart. Any activity, any practice, anything that would have a believe a, a believer, and I, I use that term loosely you know, gain or, or maintain righteousness by the exercise of, 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 of that, that whatever, that practice or that ritual. If any righteousness comes by the law, that's performing to any given standard, uh, then Christ died for nothing. Nothing. God describes our relationship uh, to the law by means of the, the he uses the, the, the analogy of a, a married woman and her spouse. A married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he's alive. Yet, should he die, then she's released from her obligation to, to her husband. But if while a, husband's, uh, or while a, a woman's husband's living, if she's joined to a, with another man, well then, now she, now she becomes an adulteress. We are espoused to Christ. We've been severed from our former relationship with sin, self, the law, the world. The law is no longer our, our master. Okay, We've died to the law in order that we might live unto God. It is all about faith, folks. Faith is what produces the righteousness of God in our lives. Not your best efforts, not your best foot forward. You know, Scripture makes references to in Christ, through Christ, of Christ, by Christ. I challenge you to find one that says in the original text that, that's, that says for Christ. I don't think you'll find it. Folks, He's risen. Christ is alive and well. He's, he's not your model. He's not your example to follow. That's, that is BS, okay? That's law, okay? It's a trick by the, by the devil to get you to think along the terms of law-keeping as a rule of life. He's not some 2,000-year-old memory. He's risen from the, from the dead. He presently lives in you, in the, in the heart of every believer. And he's, he is, God is anxious to accomplish through you what you yourself will never be able to do. This righteousness which comes from the spirit of life himself is... It, it'll always be in opposition with the dead works of the flesh, the dead works of, of your self-life. Your self-life has to be recognized as inactive, inoperative, crucified with Him, so that your body of sin might be done away with, thereby leaving, leaving you no longer a slave to sin. Our attempts, our accomplishments our frustrations, failures, were all buried with him through baptism into death. And that was accomplished by him so that we might walk in newness of life, not in oldness of the letter, which is law. We, we establish the law. I'm not anti-law. Folks, we establish the law through the spirit of life in Christ. And that's actually being accomplished in the lives of believers whether they even realize it or not. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us, Paul said. If we are to bear fruit unto God, then it, it must be accomplished through Christ, joined to Him who is risen and who is our life, not our example. It's by faith that we trust in Him and not in ourselves. It boils down to that. If that's all you, you said, if, if you just get that part, you get it all. Just trying to be the best Christian possible is not good enough. If you're doing your best to please God, then you're living according to the flesh. Okay? And if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. Death 
precedes life. Death comes before life, just as Christ gave his life for us. Okay? And as a result, we came forth. We were the fruit of that death. Same is true in our lives. So we need to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. That's Romans 6.11. It's the first command given us in the New Testament, which is interesting. Our righteousness, our very best is sin, folks. We can never outdo, outperform the, His righteousness. And when we attempt to do so, we distance ourselves from the very one that we want to draw our, ourselves close to. We need to reckon that sin nature to be dead to sin. Even our best efforts are useless since they're identified with self. The flesh profits nothing. Identified with Christ in His death, burial, resurrection. Each one of our lives was freely relinquished to our Lord the day that, that His life was given to us. All of our future belongs to Him and His purposes. And since this is true, our responsibility to constantly seek His direction is tremendous. Dearly beloved, we were brought into eternal life through a very, very special process. We came into contact with the Word of God. That didn't happen by chance or because we willed it to occur. God the Holy Spirit illumined. He opened our eyes, our mind, our understanding. But because we are His sheep, to His Word, concerning who Christ was, what He'd done, His person, His work, which is, of course, the Gospel. And faith was then granted to us by God to believe the truth of that, of that Gospel, allowing us to fully trust Him, not ourselves, Him, to trust Him and His finished work. And when we responded to that, the full work of Christ was applied to our lives. We were indwelt by the fullness of the triune God. We were born again of imperishable seed. Jesus Christ Himself in the new nature. That's why we had to be made a new nature. He can't be touched by sin. And that new nature was created sinless. It was devoid of the capability of ever sinning. This is true because His seed abides in us. And that new nature responds only to God, and it fully trusts the finished work of Christ. Anything else is of the old, old man, the old nature. The new nature loves the law of God, folks. It rejoices when Christ fulfills any requirement of the law in and through our lives. And the only blockade for that new nature to express the life of Christ is the active manifestation of the old nature. But, It is of crucial importance that I emphasize the fact that what I am I'm I'm speaking of here is for you all to do. These are not laws to uphold to accomplish this goal. They are the results, not the cause of spiritual growth. You know, I just I just talk I mentioned this walking according to the Spirit. Should the Holy Spirit place a hunger in your heart for those results to surface in your daily walk? Because it's, it's Him, it's Christ who stirs in you to change from the living death that you're now experiencing to that to fresh and living life of Christ Himself who lives within you. The only requirement placed on you is that you remain open to what the Lord has, has to show you. I am not saying that what follows is what God is expecting you to believe or do. You know, perhaps He'll use none of what, uh, you know, I've shared here with you. I'm not the Holy Spirit, and I don't know where He has you personally. 
So, the truth I'm, I'm about to talk about that, that are Christian life truths from God's Word. There's six areas of the Christian life that I believe are, are involved in being set free from this man-made bondage to the freedom that we have in Christ. Knowing, trusting, abandoning, resting, serving, and finally, the, the result of it all, worship. Now, some of those may not be new to your understanding, but the truths about them and, you know, might be quite different than what you formerly believed. When it comes to knowing, God had His Word recorded so that we could know. Know Him. Not just a whole bunch of facts about Him, but to know Him. Know Him. Know His plan. Know His will for our lives. He wants us to know. Okay? The, the, the truth that you need to know for Him to change your predicament can only be found in His Word. Not any, anywhere else. Period. Things that are true of you, whether you've realized them or not, such as, you know, that you've died with Christ at Calvary, that you're now co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You know, these these are truths, folks, that are at the at the very heart of the change that you so desperately desire. Needful truths if you're to grow in grace and knowledge of Christ. You know, that you died. You died with Christ to sin, Satan, the world, death, the law. And especially to self. That Christ paid for all your sins. That you're eternally secure because of His perfect work. I, you go on YouTube today. You, you Once saved, always saved is attacked so vehemently. You know, the truth that you're perfect in the inner man. That that new nature can't sin that you're complete in Christ, that the Christian life is actually Christ living His life through you, not you living your life. Not, you're not the vine. You're the branch. And, and folks, these truths, they have to be the bedrock of our lives. Nothing dare replace these truths. Our entire growth as a believer rises and falls upon truth. And Christ prayed, He prayed that we'd be sanctified in truth. Set apart in truth. Therefore, whatever we hold that is false will con continue to prevent us from, from growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. And then there's God's sovereignty. And all, you folks know I'm big on that. We have to be brought to an implicit trust in the, in the, the truth of God's supreme sovereignty apart from understanding and trusting that God is in control of all things, all things, all things, and circumstances, apart from that, we can't ever be content with all that He allows in our lives for our growth. Because He's going to bring some messy stuff in your life. Our eyes are never to be on our daily, uh, earthly circumstances. And then there's God's goodness. Our growth will be stunted for sure if we if we ignore the goodness of God, that He Himself is good, and that He is working all things together for our good. We can rejoice in our trials and openly praise His perfect work. He upsets the good and godly areas of our lives so that we'll be strengthened. He owns everything. He could take, a, you know, I know He deprives us from time to time. He owns, but He owns everything. He, he could supply a hundred times over what He He allowed to be taken away. But he's far more concerned about your welfare than mere material stuff. And, th and that applies to every area of our lives, whether, whether it's health, uh, reputation, relationships, goals, or anything else. His plan is perfect. And then there's the area of abandoning. Growing into the life of Christ must of necessity mean growing out of all that is not of Christ. 
You know, forward progress into truth can never occur while we cling to backward error. And 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 some areas of error might just be, I mean, obviously they're very difficult to dislodge from our experience, but go they must. And I don't care who, you know, well, my pastor told me this or my mother and father told me this. But it has to go at his prompting, not mine or anyone else's for that matter, because that is law, not grace. Okay? It's not my job to tell you, you know, when or what or how that's to go. False teaching, untrue sayings, empty rituals, all of this drives us away from Christ, not toward Him. Our relationship with Christ is a real and intimate one. Oh, dearly beloved, rituals will always drive us farther away from Him. I'm sure most of you would agree. You don't schedule some time of intimacy with a spouse or, or a loved one or, or a friend, you know, like, and especially like as if you're obligated in some way. Well, you know, it's, it's time for me to, to kiss Sue, so I, you know, I'll walk over and give her. I mean, seriously, folks, any time a formula is given you to, to perform step by step, then you've been handed a new ritual. And rituals are death to any relationship. I don't care what it is. You've heard me talk a lot about resting. The Holy Spirit, through the author of Hebrews, He knew full well the difficulty that we would have resting in Him. That's why He, he said it. He called it a labor. We're to labor, therefore. So it shouldn't it it should come as little surprise when we read the language that the Holy Spirit used in Hebrews when he says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. What rest? What rest is he talking about? I invite you to spend some time looking at that. Rest is based on imparted truth from the Word of God. We need to, there's areas that we need to rest in. Just as I've been talking about, we need to rest in His righteousness in us. We need to rest in His sovereignty over all the circumstances in our lives. Until we're able to do that, then guilt, condemnation will take its place. God's rejected Satan, the one who accuses you. God's rejected him. You're going to side with Satan? He even makes intercession for us. Christ does. Why should we side with Satan against God? And then there's his timing. That's a tough one too. You know, a lot of us are looking forward to the rapture. We want to go home. Is the timing resting in his timing for all for everything, folks? That allows us to line ourselves up with His will. When we become anxious over any part of our Christian life, we're, we're actually what we're claiming is that well, God, God's perfect work is faulty. He He didn't He didn't do it right, or He didn't do enough. And then you know, there's the level of our spiritual growth, our maturity. Uh, that's that's a tough one. You need to know that God has provided the needed measure of maturity according to the need of the body of Christ, folks, and you're part of it, okay? Don't be disappointed. You're not the least bit inferior to the most mature believer. Each believer, each one of us have our own position, our own responsibility, regardless of our level of maturity. And we can rest in His reason for having us at the level of growth that that we're at, at, at any time, at any given time. And we, we don't ever have to long after uh, others' position in, in Christ. Listen, dearly beloved. When one believer takes it upon himself to exhort another believer to straighten out his life in, in any given area, and I don't care what that is, then he risks the probability of misleading that dear brother for whom Christ died away from the area of God's purposed work in his life. 
We need to lead, to learn to leave the direction of God's sanctifying work up to Him and, and rest in that area where God is working in our lives. We do that, it leaves us with the, the, the assurance that, that God, these good and these godly characteristics will surface in our own daily walk. You know, there's a, it's a really strange thing happens in the life of the new believer. You know, a precious little time passes since, you know, from when he was, he was on his knees declaring his total bankruptcy. Imagine that. Bankruptcy of, of worth, ability, until, you know, and now, and now here he is. He's storming the throne of heaven, beseeching God to tell him what he can do for God. Amazing. Just amazing. Just shortly before, he didn't have anything to offer God, and now he assumes his nothingness is the very fulfillment of God's need. The truth, folks, is that service is the life of Jesus flowing out of us to others. His life through us serves others rather than our lives serving others for him. Therein lies the difference between law and grace. You know, the, the spirit and the flesh, uh, that which is heavenly, that which is earthly. Our service has to come out of our new nature whereby He performs that righteous service. All we can present anybody is the old, ugly, rotten self. The manifestation of the Old, old nature, you know, with all of its depraved intentions and, and methods. But Christ, He's got everything to offer. And He's fully competent to accomplish it in true righteousness. So if we haven't come into a personal understanding of truth in a given area, it's impossible to have Christ minister through us in that area. Now, that, I, I suppose, you know, the apostles and the, the prophets, they were the only ones to escape that. that the, of course, they, had, they communicated inspired truth never before given. So they, they couldn't have a... Uh, it was just different in their case. So truth preceded personal application you know, which uh, surfaced in their walk. But for us, we are not instruments for the giving of inspired first-time revelation, despite uh, I don't know how many YouTube channels there are out there that would promote such foolishness. Believe me when I tell you, theological error precedes moral error. Jesus came to give us life. He came to give us life more abundantly. And it is out of that abundance, out of that abundance, that our service is supplied with authenticity. And those to whom you minister, you speak to, you stop on the street, and you talk to, they could perceive Him when they see it. A lot of people will concentrate on the quality of their delivery style rather than on the content of their message. Blessed hope for forever it, uh, uh, tries to avoid all that. He's our life. He's our message. I've said this over and over and over again. I'll keep on saying it. Ministry apart from His life is merely a ministry from self. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Our privilege is, is to offer Christ to the needy. And I'm talking about both saved and unsaved. And trust that God the Holy Spirit will do the work of convincing them of their need. You can't beat anybody over the head with a Bible. That, that doesn't work. Our adequacy, said Paul, is from God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Not from ourselves. 
And then finally we come to that for which everything is, well, it all leads to. And that's worship. All the work he, he, he does in us and causing us to grow and reach out to others in service has the goal of bringing glory to Christ and worship from us. The very essence of true worship is returning to God a true estimation and honor of, for who He is and what He's done. His, our estimation of His value, His worth. Okay? God is spirit. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And until we're freed from the false objects of worship to the true, we'll, we'll be held back. In, our, in the most intimate area of our spiritual growth. We worship Him for who He is, for all that He's done in our lives, for what He's doing in our lives today, right now, we, for, for what He's doing in and through your life, in and for others. I've, I've often said that if, if all we did was give, thank, thank Him for everything he, He's doing in our lives, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. And, and all of that worship, true worship, it cancels out any thought of self-accomplishment. When lives are being changed right before your eyes by His ministry through you, well, the temptation, and it's a strong one, is to look toward yourself and, and attribute His success as though it were your own. Self-pride, it's a horrid monster. But praise relegates that self to the cross where he belongs. God bless you all. Uh, I love you and I appreciate you all for, for who you are and all that you are and, and all that you do in my life. It's my desire and prayer that God will place his desire and ever increasing hunger in your life to know Him, to grow in grace and knowledge of Him, to want these characteristics to surface in your own, own walk and in, in your own life. They're not things to do. There isn't a single one that you can do. Why? Why is that? Because they are characteristics of His life. We, we don't produce the vine, the, the, the divine. You know, He's, it's interesting, divine, <laughs> divine. He's the vine. We're the branches. My prayer is that you'll be receptive rather than resistant whenever He makes real these precious truths in your heart, which I try to present in, in just about every video that I do. We'll continue on in our study in Revelation in a few days. Till next time, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.